Hello everybody, welcome to the Boxing Size Podcast, another nutrition Q&A with our performance nutritionist, Lee Rickards. Lee is going to be covering a range of different subjects today, how to manage the post-fight binge that I know a lot of boxers struggle with, recovering from illness, in particular like a flu type illness and how nutritional strategies can help improve health, get you back into peak performance and also how nutritional strategies can help you sleep better and a few more subjects as well. Before we kick on with the questions, like I say every time, if you can press the like button or give us a rating, this will help elevate the status of the podcast, which will help us provide you with even more content at Boxing Science. Thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoy this episode with Lee Rickards. So question one we received on Instagram was mental health after a fight regarding kind of post food. So here what happens is many people overindulge in food in the week after a fight. And what this causes is a really high influx of energy, which is going to lead to fat gain. Really, it's not that what's the primary cause is to go back and think what happened before it. So what many people do is they diet themselves too extreme to make weight. And then what happens this is basically causes a lot of alterations in hormones, especially leptin and ghrelin, which causes you to be really hungry and not remain full. And then after that fight, you're going to basically just indulge in every food you've been craving. So what I would say is at the start, we need to make sure that we are on a negative energy balance, but nothing too steep. And by that is you need to give yourself enough time to make weight. So what people do, especially taking a fight at late notice, is they're going to cause a big rapid drop in terms of energy. It's going to cause a bigger rise in energy after the fight. Give yourself a lot more time to make weight and you should be aiming to lose around one to two pounds of body fat per week. If we're going at a greater rate at 2.2 to like say three pounds per week, what this causes is causes a loss of lean body mass. Loss of lean body mass is our key regulator of resting metabolic rate. A study into 2022 by Martins and groups, what they found was there was an inverse association. So the people who lost more amount of lean body mass actually gained weight at a higher rate compared to those who didn't. Now this is related to some kind of statin signals in our muscles linked to our brain to actually overconsume energy. So it's really important we maintain as much lean body mass as we can when we're dieting. So when we're dieting towards that fight, we want to make sure we're having a good intake of carbohydrates and protein to retain lean body mass and for performance. And then just be on a slight negative energy balance by aiming around a one to two pound drop per week. In terms of the post fight, there are a few strategies what we can do here to stop that big influx of energy. We do like to give kind of a lot of fighters and a lot of athletes a bit of freedom around a few days after a fight. So certainly say one to two days after a fight, having some nice foods with your family or partner who's been supporting is really important. On that week, we do like to encourage a lot of our boxers to still exercise. And the reason for this is usually in the week, or two weeks before a fight, we make our athletes taper. So they're not doing as much exercise towards that fight just to make sure they're fresh. So actually in the week or two weeks after a fight, you should still be able to train because you're not going to be too fatigued. Doing some kind of active recovery exercise just to make sure that we're expending some energy because we're intaking more just to keep that weight from rising too much. So whether that's going for kind of a little run, bike ride, swimming, just some kind of circuit gym sessions, just nothing too hard and strenuous, but something just to help manage your weight a lot more easily. And then over time, what this will do is going to help you stop having a big intake of energy and a big weight increase after the fight. If you are one who is rebounding weight quite hard, then you certainly need to have a look at your diet pre-fight and also give yourself more time. So rather than looking at fights late notice it's probably something to kind of consider with your management team actually I probably need 10 to 12 week camp just to make sure I can get my body set in the right way from a kind of a hormonal and energy point of view. A question which was kind of related to this as well was kind of eating disorders for a fire. Now in eating disorders are a really prevalent condition which many people have so one in four people do have it and it's really important you get the right guidance and the right kind of qualification people to help you. So kind of in this uh, podcast, what we'll do is we'll send some links uh, below for those who think they've got an eating disorder to get the right professional help. A lot of eating disorders can be anything from kind of bulimia and even exercise induced bulimia. So basically this is where people are over exercising for a long period amount of time to kind of manage that energy balance of those kind of eating episodes. 
and also there's a lot more extreme circumstances. So if you are someone who thinks you've got an eating disorder, then it's really important to actually be open about it and get the right help so it can help improve your mental health down the line. The next question we had was how is best to recover from flu? and they were having kind of weak legs during training. So in terms of when you have flu, your body's fighting infection. So when your body's fighting infection, it tends to retain a lot of water. And also during illness, actually there's rise in resting metabolic rate because as I said, it's fighting infection, your body's wanting to overcome it. So what's really important here is not to underfuel yourself for training, especially as you're coming back. So we want to make sure we have an adequate amount of carbohydrates. The reason for this is they fuel our immune system as well as basically improving kind of our exercise performance. So I'd certainly say if you are recovering from flu, we don't want to be on a big negative energy balance. So what this is going to do is probably going to prolong the amount of time it is for you to feel better. This should coincide with a kind of well-structured training load plan. So in terms of looking at your kind of tra training load, managing your kind of rises in training load and, and your troughs in terms of recovery, is we just want to manage that around when you're kind of getting symptoms of illness and also as you're returning back. There are some kind of practical strategies we can use to help decrease your risk of getting flu or kind of common colds, especially as you're dieting, we're at an increased risk of getting illness. So some practical tips I would advise you to do is one, carry an antibacterial hand gel. So carry this around with you and use frequently, especially around a training session when you're wearing gloves and wearing hand wraps. Number two is to don't share personal items. So towels, whether it's boxing gloves, drinks bottles with other people. Three is try and keep away from infectious people. If your partner is maybe unwell and you've got a fight coming or whether you're going around to your parents' house and they're unwell, possibly wise to stay away from them. So whether it's to sleep in a bare room for a couple of nights where they're ill, just to make sure that you've got that distance so you don't catch that flu. Also, another one is to make sure that we're doing is to get in seven to eight hours of sleep per night. There's a lot of studies which actually show that sleeping less than seven hours per night increases your risk quite considerably of catching an illness. As well as practical tips, there's certain nutritional tips that we can use to help reduce our risk of kind of catching a cold when we're training. One, avoid rapid weight loss. If we're on a really negative energy balance, energy fuels our immune system to fight infection. So if we're dropping a lot of weight in a short amount of time, this is really going to increase our risk of getting ill. Number two is to ensure that we're having enough carbohydrates, especially around your training sessions pre and post workout. In that one to two hour window of after a training session, we're at an increased risk of catching illness just because our body is actually depleted of energy. So having carbohydrates in that period is really important. Another tip is to make sure we're keeping hydrated for training sessions. So in terms of our mouth, a lot of studies with salivary IgA, so basically this is antibacterial in our mouth in terms of saliva. So as we are dehydrated, this drops, which makes our risk of catching infection in terms of kind of in our mouth is actually much higher. So this is a really important aspect within kind of boxing and training is to make sure keeping hydrated. Still having a high intake of fruits and vegetables. So we know these are high in um, antioxidants and vitamin C, which is going to have a really strong effect on our immune system. In terms of kind of supplements which can help reduce our illness. So there's a lot of links between having low vitamin D levels and being at an increased risk of flu and cold, especially during winter months. So supplementing with around 2000 to 4000 IU of vitamin D3 per day is going to help um, improve our immune system. Combining this with some probiotics, so there's a lot of studies by like Michael Gleason and colleagues actually shows that supplementing with a probiotic every day for kind of 16 weeks reduce the severity of episodes of upper respiratory tract infections in elite athletes. Also at the onset of illness, there's a couple of supplements we can do to actually try and overcome illness at much quicker. So one is zinc lozenges. So Wang in 2020 had a look at consuming 75 milligram of zinc acetate lozenges every day at the um, onset of feeling actually quite ill. What they found is this actually speeded up the amount of time it were to get back to full health. Also, Hamilla and Choker in 2013 had a look at vitamin C and consuming over 1000 milligram of vitamin C and up towards kind of 5000 milligram of vitamin C per day reduced the amount of time there was spent ill, but also the severity of that illness. So having a lot lower symptoms. So these are two supplements I'd certainly recommend if you do get the symptoms of illness and you are competing soon.
The next question was foods and nutrition to help sleep. So there is some evidence around kind of certain foods and overall general nutrition and energy in terms of helping sleep. In terms of energy, there's a very recent study from Liverpool John Moores with Thomas and Carl Lang and Evans, and they tracked sleep in a male combat sport athlete on energy availability. And what they found is literally all the way through camp, there wasn't any adverse effects on sleep, even though they were on low energy availability. And this wasn't affected until kind of a couple of days before a fight. And the reason for this is probably due to the large amount of weight cut, but also kind of anxiety and arousal around making weight and fighting. So in terms of that, some evidence there to actually low energy availability doesn't seem to affect sleep. Some might have thought previous. In terms of foods, there is a lot of kind of evidence around kind of high GI carbohydrates, especially say three, four hours before bedtime to help sleep onset latency in terms of feeling tired. So a tip I would say is if you are struggling to kind of fall asleep, I'd probably recommend having kind of a high carbohydrate dinner, maybe say four hours before sleep. And this can help relax and kind of increase that sleep onset latency time. The supplement to help sleep is kind of tart cherry juice. Glenn Howitt's in it in 2010. I had a look at kind of two servings of Monmouth's tart cherry juice per day to look at sleep quality and sleep onset latency. And this was done with kind of athletes or participants who struggled to fall asleep. And they actually found that it did improve sleep quality and sleep onset latency. Tart cherries are quite high in melatonin and the high in antioxidants. Quite a lot of research behind people who have insomnia having a low intake of antioxidants because they're in a chronic state of inflammation and oxidative stress. They linked the tart cherry juice to having high levels of melatonin, but also being high in antioxidant. So as well in terms of supplements, in terms of dietary intake, I'd certainly recommend in increasing the amount of antioxidants in your diet by fruit and vegetables. In terms of fruits, high in antioxidants, you're looking at kind of berries, so blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, cranberries, even if you can have some blackberries and also mangoes and kiwis and bananas are also high in polyphenols. Another kind of fruit which has received research by Lynn and colleagues was kiwi fruit. And what they found was having two servings of kiwi fruit per day improved sleep quality in participants who had insomnia symptoms. So they're kind of two kind of supplements and also foods to increase in your diet which could possibly help. Foods high in tryptophan as well can help improve sleep onset latency. So foods which are high in tryptophan a kind of amino acid food, so kind of turkey, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt. These help increase a bit of dopamine in our brain, which can help make us feel relaxed. Maybe a, a protein rich snack, they wanted two hours before bed, whether it's a bit of Greek yogurt or maybe like a, a turkey sandwich, cottage cheese with a bit of crackers. One, this can help our recovery overnight in terms of amino acids, but also it could actually increase our sleep quality kind of sleep quality. What many people do struggle with is getting into a sleep routine. So in terms of non-nutrition related things we can do to help improve sleep is one is to sleep in quite a cold room. So as our body temperature is high, it struggles to fall asleep and to stay asleep. Two, in terms of hydration, many people get up for a wee in the middle of the night and this can be due to various things. What I would say is maybe having kind of a low strength electrolyte drink with dinner just to help replenish hydration, but also make sure that we're not urinating through night just with low sodium is going to cause frequent waking episodes in the night. Training late at night as well has been shown to actually decrease sleep. Now, many athletes who train or compete late at night, such as footballers, struggle to sleep that night. Basically, this is due to probably increased body temperature as well as kind of arousal and anxiety. Taking kind of a cold shower can actually help reduce that body temperature to make sure we nod off to sleep. A practical tip to help sleep is also write a journal or a diary. Many athletes have kind of, it's called the race in mind, so where they can't switch off in terms of competition, in terms of whether it's technical or, or tactical, or even just being busy with life. Writing down kind of a to-do list before bed in a journal or in a diary can just help kind of get rid of some of those thoughts which you're gonna think through sleep to take that off your mind to help sleep. Also what we don't want is around an hour before bed we want to cut out kind of phone and TV use. So a lot of blue light can affect kind of our eyes around melatonin and sleep. So kind of reducing that is a really good strategy to help improve sleep quality. A question we received was 
tips to help females cut in weight. So in terms of females, we know that in terms of their kind of menstrual cycle, they will hold water and hold weight at different periods throughout a month. This is where it's really important to track weight quite closely over the weeks. So what we would say is possibly take weight either every day or kind of Monday, Wednesday, Friday every week. This over time will help us identify whether we're losing weight at a kind of a gradual and a long period over time. From experience, what we've noticed with females is they don't drop weight as consistently as males. In terms of men, you usually see a rough drop each point each week. With females, due to kind of the menstrual cycle, masking some of the weight drop by body fat. What sometimes we see, they will one drop weight for quite a long period of time and then they'll drop quite suddenly. And then same again, they might have a plateau and drop quite a lot. Quite easy for females to get frustrated in terms of losing weight. And this is when what they will usually do is drop calories too low. Getting regular assessments of body composition is really important for a female, in my opinion. And this is just to make sure that they are losing body fat even if weight's not coming down. So that gives us confidence that that weight will drop sooner rather than later. So if you get somebody who's qualified in terms of the Isaac um, Skinfold Protocol, if you use a BIA, so bioelectrical impedance, and you do this kind of first thing in the morning fasted, or if you have the ability to get a DEXA scan, um, whether you get proof from your doctor, stuff are really good strategies to utilize to make sure that your body composition is coming down as it should do. In terms of females, they judge themselves to men quite a lot. In terms of men, they can get down to around 8% or lower body fat levels. In terms of females, probably want them to possibly go as low as maybe as 12%. Great case study by John Sullivan and Carl Langan Evans and Dan Martin, which was out last year in terms of kind of weight strategies for a female combat sport athlete. Same again, they advise probably not going below 12%. Now, 15 to 12% body fat in females is low and it is lean. Many people don't think it because they're kind of comparing themselves to the male counterparts. So this is also another kind of strategy to think is actually, are you actually pushing your body too low? Females push the bodies too low, that weight will stagnate because it's basically their body to say, actually, we're at our limit. So it's really important to possibly have a look at your kind of weight you're competing at and see what body fat percentage level you're competing at. Also, what is really important is to not focus on the scale weight every day. So some factors will affect kind of that scale every day. And this can be fiber intake and also kind of water intake. So if you're training late at night and then you're having a meal and you're rehydrating and you're taking your weight next morning, you're going to have a lot of food and fluid in your stomach. Don't get frustrated in terms if you wake up one day, maybe you've gained one to two, three pounds. This isn't going to be body fat if you are on a negative energy balance. It's basically impossible. So it's really important if you're a female to track your weight a lot throughout the week and make sure that we are getting an average weight drop over the weeks. One week might stay the same, but it will gradually come down if you look at it from afar. Give yourself a lot of time to make weight so females don't respond to a sudden weight drop. Losing a lot of weight in a short period of time is kind of quite harmful for females. This has been shown to affect menstrual cycle. So you don't have to be getting to really low levels of body fat to kind of affect it. There is some research to actually say just having a sudden drop of energy in a short period of time can affect our menstrual cycle. Going long and steady to lose weight usually wins the race in that department for females. Final question in this Q&A was, what should an amateur be consuming post weighing before a fight? So in terms of amateurs, there's a limited opportunity to refuel before a fight. Some may get kind of two to three hours, depending on the weight category they're competing in. Some may get six, seven to eight hours. We need a rapid replenishment of energy in that short period of time. Probably going to be best coming from fluids because this is going to help rehydrate in terms of performance, but also refuel. And it's going to have lower risk of GI distress. Increasing your intake of maybe isotonic drinks, whether it's a Lucozade, whether it's a carbohydrate electrolyte drink. So like SIS, do a Go Electrolyte drink. Nutrition X, do a Hydra Fuel. These are quite high in carbohydrates, which is going to rapidly replenish our muscle glycogen in a short period of time. In terms of the rate we probably want to go at, we probably want to consume kind of 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram carbohydrates to body mass. So if you are a 60 kilogram athlete, we are probably wanting to consume around 72 to 90 grams of carbohydrates and want to do this every one to two hours. Doing this in kind of smaller amounts of kind of food 
is going to help reduce that GI distress as we're competing. Also, there's some studies from kind of cycling and Tour de France by Mark Harris and colleagues is actually consuming this in a variety of kind of liquids, gels, and even kind of like bars or sweets and snacks will reduce those GI symptoms, probably because it's coming from different forms of carbohydrates, including sucrose, in terms of glucose and fructose. In terms of practical strategies, maybe a Lucozade and an energy gel post weighing, jam on white bread, or some honey with kind of some fruit yogurt with a sliced banana. So basically what's happening there is we're getting some glucose and fructose to our muscles and to also our liver to help replenish that energy for when we fight. Having low fiber and low volume meals is probably key at this point. So last thing we want is to have a big pasta dish or a big noodle dish after a weigh-in if we've only got two or four hours to fight. We're probably wanting something a bit more higher energy density for less food volume. Maybe some rice pudding with jam, which is just kind of easily absorbed. Or it could just be maybe some basmati rice with a bit of soy sauce, just so these foods are lower in fiber, less food volume, so it's gonna be a lot lighter on our stomach. Whilst we're warming up ready for the fight, we can still get some energy, uh, which is gonna top up some blood glucose levels, and also a kind of a mouth rinse in our mouth, which goes to our brain in terms of kind of a sensory mechanism to help improve performance. A strategy to utilize in your warm-up is to sip on a carbohydrate drink and either mouth rinse it around your mouth before you're consuming it, and also to have an energy gel around five minutes before the bout. This is to help control kind of blood glucose levels as you're going into that fight. Another question we received was, should I have caffeine before a fight and also sweets before a fight? In terms of caffeine, it's one of the most research evidence-based supplements out there to improve performance. A lot of studies by Gragic on kind of strength and power performance, aerobic and aer aerobic endurance, and it all improves performance because it delays fatigue and it also reduces the rate of perceived exertion. It's really important to trial it. And I'd only use caffeine if you're above 18 years of age. The reason for this is it can easily go wrong if you consume the wrong dose. So if you are over 18 years of age, potentially use some caffeine, but also use it in training sessions before you use it in a fight. The reason for this is there's a lot of kind of side effects in terms of anxiety related to caffeine. And when you're getting anxious and quite alert around a fight, sometimes it can work opposite and actually increase the anxiety too much that you can't possibly maybe control your nerves as much as you'd like. Trial it in training. You want around three milligram per kilogram of body mass to have an ergogenic effect. You can have this either in tablet formula, you can have it in terms of coffee, you could also have it in gel formula, so you can have a caffeine energy gel, and you can also have it in caffeine gum. So if you are 60 kilogram, you probably want to have 180 milligram of caffeine, and you want to have this around 45 minutes to an hour before a training session to help increase kind of dose response or, and also the time it takes to work. Having that now before a training session, see how you feel and trial it. If you feel fine, then I would use it then in a fight. If you train late at night, I wouldn't use it because it's going to have an adverse effect on your sleep, which is important for recovery. In terms of sweets before a fight, you can use sweets because they're quite high energy density. They're high in glucose, so it's going to be a rapidly rapid supply of energy and also you're not going to heat a massive full bag to make you feel kind of nauseous it's just going to be a little serving so in past i have used a few sweets with some fighters just to get some carbohydrates and glucose on board but i just make sure that your diet before that is kind of good in terms of you're getting whole foods because just relying on sweets around kind of rapid energy after a weigh-in and before a fight if you're having a low intake of fruit and vegetables which is high in micronutrients you're probably going to increase your risk of illness. Okay, that's the end of this week's episode of the Boxing Science Podcast. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Whatever device that you're on, I'd just like to ask a quick favour. If you're not a subscriber yet, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future content. And if you like the content, whatever platform that you're on, if you can press the like button or give us a five-star review, this would be fantastic for the growth of the Boxing Science Podcast. Looking to some big things this year. Your support means the world to us. Thank you very much. Hopefully see you on the next episode of the Boxing Science Podcast.